Good morning. Hi. Um, my name's Chris Hayes. I work for Skanska and I'm going to give you um, a view on a user's perspective of the NCC tool um, based on a project that we're currently working on up in Doncaster. Um, to put it in context a little bit, the um, project already had planning permission, so it's a retrospective use of the tool. So any decisions uh, that could be made that would impact the score and feed back into the loop in order to promote a, a, a better development maybe, uh, those opportunities have already gone by. So a little bit about the project, a little bit about Skanska actually. Um, 1887 in Sweden. Um, do around a 12 billion pound a year in revenue, 1.2 billion in the UK, um, about 5,000 staff in the UK. Um, we open and close approximately 30 projects a day globally, so quite a large organisation that you know, potential to have a large impact on the work that we do on behalf of our customers and ourselves. So a little bit about Bentley. For those of you unfamiliar with north of Watford, it's up the A1M, about 200 miles, and you get to Doncaster. Just north of Doncaster again, so even further north, is Bentley. Um, it's an urban area, semi-urban area, um, predominantly residential with some small kind of town centre uh, activities such as shops and the likes. This is um, an image of the site. It's a brownfield site. Cementation Skanska have actually operated from the site for over 100 years. So it's been developed, it's changed, the use has changed, bits have been sold, bits have been developed again. So it's kind of this sporadic growth over the past century or so. Um, it's within a residential area, as I said. To the northwest of the site, you have the Trans Pennine route from um, Merseyside over to the coast in the northeast. So there's good public access, and to the um, bottom end of the site, though, which is the east of the site, is the East Coast railway line between London and Edinburgh. So it's, it's a brownfield site, it's definitely a brownfield site. The proposed scheme, or the actual scheme, because we're on site building at the moment, is to demolish the existing workshops that have been built up over the past hundred years or so, replace that with a new workshop, state of the art facility, um, to allow cemetery scans because activities to grow and expand, um, employ new staff and, and service um, our customers. There'll also be a new office there, um, demolition of the old office, construction of a new office, and there'll be some residential um, use. So the northern end of the site has been partitioned and will be sold for residential development at some point in the future. So that's the development on site. Value is around 14 million. Um, part of that money is from a regional growth fund, which is used to help secure jobs and to create new jobs in the North East. Um, and also there's an investment from Skanska, it, it's all Skanska investments, I should say, this is one of our own developments. Uh, it's a development by Skanska for Skanska. And part of the investment here is uh, an additional capital sum to get this to be what we call a deep green project, which I'll come on to explain in a, in a little while. All the interventions that I'm going to talk about have been costed, whole life cost optioneering to make sure that any, anything that we do over and above what's required for planning actually pays back and has value. So the total payback for that additional green investment is about 11 years. So this is the colour palette. This is what we use to benchmark all of our projects globally. You can see that um, we start at what we call vanilla, which is something that's compliant with legislation. Moving over to deep green, which is how we define um, net zero um, environmental impacts in construction. So we measure things such as energy, and from a construction point of view, this is energy that the building will use once it's occupied. We look at the embodied carbon of the materials and how we, how we make the building. We look at the materials that we incorporate into the building, how sustainable they are, how hazardous they are, and we also look at the water that will be used in the operation of that building. So using potable water for non-potable uses is a waste of a resource, so we try to drive that out. So you can see what I'm trying to get over is that, you know, this for us is a deep green development. This is something that's important to us, but what we don't really measure very well, um, currently using the colour palette, is biodiversity. So it's something that it's not necessarily missing. We did consider it Part of my involvement in this project is to see whether this NCC tool would be a good way 
of measuring our impact on ecosystem services above and beyond what would be a standard methodology to do it. So you can see that it's going to be net zero energy, there will be biomass which will have an impact on atmospheric emissions which will input into the tool, uh, there will be photovoltaics on site, um, again we're specifying low impact materials but hopefully that will have an impact on the score that comes out of using the NCC tool and how we use water on site in terms of rainwater capture, rainwater storage and rainwater reuse will also impact on the score that comes out of the tool. So all these things kind of tie in together so it's a really good project for us to, to be involved with, with Birmingham and the MEBC. So going back to the project then, um, the tool needs input. You need to understand what your starting point is, what you're doing and what potential impact that's going to have. As we'd already gone through planning for this project, we already had an awful lot of data. So we had ecologist reports, we had archaeology reports, we had a borough cultural assessments, we'd been out to the local community and consulted. So we had an awful lot of good information, which is why we selected this project as, a, as an easy way of testing the tool to see how it works as a user, as a developer. It is a spreadsheet, you can't get away from that. Um, I'm not a great spreadsheets person, I have to admit, but I managed to use this tool. Um, it took me about a day of understanding what the reports were telling us, loading that up into the, um, into the spreadsheet. Um, on a short term basis you'll see there's um, green and red bits, green being positive, red being potentially negative, I'll come on to those in a little while, and the longer term ones. So, how did we fare? How did the project sit using the, um, the NCC tool? In the short term, there's potential negative impacts on recreation with the adjacent cost-to-cost um, -cost walkway and potential negative impacts on air quality. So this is to do with using things like biomass boilers which create nitrogen oxide emissions that could potentially have a negative impact on local air quality. So those were the potential short-term issues. Over the long term though, it's a much better picture and everything comes out green apart from recreation. Well, the reason recreation doesn't come out green is because it's a factory. It's a closed facility. It's not really there open to the public for public access, recreational use, exercise. So it's not really, um, you know, it's not an area that we can really focus on too much with this type, of, this type of project. Soil quality is another area that didn't really turn green over the long term, probably because it is an industrial site. We have remediated it for the purpose of the development, but it will remain an industrial site. So there is a potential risk for of the long term. And we've only remediated what we've needed to remediate. So those were the only two bits that didn't really turn green. So all in all, luckily for us, it meets all the criteria for the, um, for the NCC tool. And we'll hopefully have got the thumbs up from, from the authority and, and the academics in order to go ahead. It's been a good, positive development when looking at ecosystem services. So that's using the tool. As a user, some of the issues that, that came up when you're, you're sitting there and you're looking at the spreadsheet and you're looking at all the information that you have, is that you broadly have these benefits or potential impacts, whether they're economic. So what's the economic benefit to Skanska as a developer? Well, there's a potential to develop this site, to operate the site and maybe um, divest it later on and make a profit. We are a company, we have shareholders, we have to return a profit to the market, so there would be an economic benefit to ourselves. There might also be an economic benefit to the local community, so we start to employ more local people. There's another 70 jobs being created at this site, so there's an obvious economic benefit there. An economic benefit to the shops and other services in the area that might benefit, so looking at those areas. And then you have the social impacts. So a sense of community maybe, that job security that's created, um, potential social impacts in terms of um, good employment, good wages, uh, training of people, um, so the social benefits outside of, um, outside of the organisation and more in the community, and environmental benefits. So have we remediated the site, um, what's going to be the impact on air quality, um, through the work and through the work that we're doing in terms of rainwater capture and storage, what's the potential environmental benefit or, or loss in terms of flood alleviation, what's the impact on climate change in terms of how we're powering the site. So all of these benefits um, could sit with ourselves, it could sit with the community, it could sit with the authority. They sit in various pots and various 
areas. One of the issues that we had then is because you've got multiple potential impacts and multiple benefits, is what units do you use to measure those? Economic could be quite simple, it could be pounds, shillings and pence, or it could be a bit more complicated and you could look at jobs created, or you could look at um, how that pound is spent, is it a local pound and could you multiply it by five because it keeps getting spent in the local community. Um, the social benefits, so what are the social benefits, who benefits from them, is there a social benefit to our workforce, having employment close to the place of work, close to the, where they live, um, other social benefits could be that, um, oh, I don't know, there could be other social benefits, but environmental benefits again, how do you measure flood alleviation? What is the unit of measure for flood alleviation? And not just the how, how high the floodplain is, but the impact on a resident or the impact on a community from a severe flood event. So these things are difficult to put a number or an SI unit against. And that's one of the issues that, that we've got when you start to use the tool in this current version. And, and Oliver went on to say earlier on that you know, we are trying to, to get funding to develop this further and make it more simple to use and define those measures. So then once you've got a unit of measure, you then need to think about, well, it's a development site, we've bought the site, we're going to develop the site, we will benefit, so we will pay a, a sum for that site. But if you don't develop it, then because the, it's got a greater potential and a greater benefit to the community or a floodplain or something else, then who pays for that? And how much do they pay and when do they pay? So as a developer, you could take a relatively short-term view, say five, ten years to divest, or you could take a longer-term view and divest later on, and there's, you know, that's quite straightforward. But then as a floodplain, as an example, you know, that could be 100, 130 years. And who benefits from that and over when and how much? So, yeah, who then benefits? So if it is a floodplain, is it the community that benefits? And should the community contribute to no development? Is it the water company or the environment agency and should they contribute into this? Or is it the developer through um, sort of section 61 and planning process to offset somewhere else and pay a fee for the development? And then who defines those values? Who defines those common sets of metrics? Um, and there's various views on that. I mean, my view is that you know, it needs to be done collaboratively. It needs to involve the industry, it needs to involve the academics, it needs to involve government, and we need to arrive at a collective set of values and measures that are universally understood and universally accepted in order to make this process quick, easy to use, and supportive of development or no development decisions. And then the other thing that kind of came up is, how do you avoid double accounting? So the UK government has set, oh, as part of Europe, a 2050 carbon goal to reduce our carbon emissions by 2050. Part of that strategy of reduction involves planting forests or using natural capital services to fix carbon in trees. So a woodland has a value and the government has already selected parts of woodland that has that value and is counted towards the climate change commitments. If we buy a site as a developer and we go to develop a site and it involves removal of trees, that might have a negative impact on carbon, or if we plant, that might have a positive impact on carbon and climate change. But who benefits? Is that my benefit or is the UK government benefit or is it the authorities benefit? So trying to work out who benefits and when they benefit and make sure that you're only counting it once rather than multiple times. I, I, I kind of said this earlier, but the metrics need to be relevant. I need to understand them. My construction teams need to understand them, the planners need to understand them, everybody involved, the community more importantly, needs to understand what the metrics are so they can see why a development has been granted or not granted planning permission and it's clear and obvious and there's no um, over scrutiny. So it does require this collaborative approach. I have a certain set of skills, Nick, Oliver, Rupert, I'll have different skill sets, I'll bring a a different perspective to the development of the tool. And it's using that collaboration and that shared knowledge and understanding that will help us progress this tool and move it along. It'll also help us to identify and quantify those long-term benefits, which are not quite as tangible as a short-term benefit. They're difficult to quantify and difficult to put, a, to put a number against. But it will also help the developers um, and the city um, look on, on the wider scale of 
whether a development goes ahead or not, and where it should go ahead, and why it should go ahead in that area. So this, this combined approach to a, a city-scale development, rather than using it as a one-off on a single project, which we've just done to trial this tool today. So, to recap, it is a useful tool. Once you can use the spreadsheet, said it took me a day to do. If I was doing this repetitively on a number of projects, it would be quicker, but you need the information behind you. So it is a useful tool. Um, once the metrics are established, it will aid decision-making quicker. Maybe it should form part of the planning. Maybe it should be done uh, at a, a wider uh, city-scale development plan. And I know that's something that Nick's been looking at. It does help promote understanding. Something turns red or something turns green. It's really obvious. So once the metrics are set and the values are right, it's very obvious why a decision has been made and the, the use of, of that tool in, in arriving at that decision. And also a Skanska, when I'm starting to look at biodiversity, you now we normally we use biodiversity action plans on the projects. Um, we use the information from environmental impact assessments from ecology reports, they help us to do things like BRIAM assessments and get credits on the BRIAM assessments. But all these are very sort of building orientated and very specific. What it doesn't allow me to do as an organisation is to continuously improve and get the process in place at the lowest to make sure that as we continue to develop, we take the learning from one and we can improve our impacts on natural capital as we go forward on all of our projects. So this kind of tool would be supportive of a biodiversity measure within our colour palette. And more importantly, if it's part of planning and this satisfies those planning requirements, it's very obvious then for us to say, okay, we have a planning condition, we need to satisfy, we need to close out, here's the tool to do it, let's get on and do it. So it would promote speedy development and create that understanding. And just to finish, it will support our journey to Cheap Green, and I hope you can join us on that journey. I'll now pass on to Rupert for the uh, next part. Thank you.